So um, we start? Yeah? Okay. Okay, hello and uh, a very warm welcome to our debate today with Manfred Weber, the Spitzenkandidat of the EPP group. Um, I think Manfred Weber doesn't need much introduction, but let me just mention that um, he is, of course, in the European Parliament since 2004 and leading the uh, party group, the EPP group, since 2014. Um, and he has been uh, elected as the uh, Spitzenkandidat, um, the lead candidate. Uh, in Helsinki at the EPP summit. Uh, before we start the debate, um, uh, let me um, uh, just give a little bit of housekeeping. So the plan is to uh, have four blocks um, uh, of substantive discussions. Uh, the first block is the most general one, future of Europe growth and so on. The second um, is about trade policies. The third one is about um, uh, uh, divergences in Europe and in the Eurozone. The last section is about um, competition policy and industrial policy. So we have those four, uh, four blocks. If you would like to ask a question in one of those four blocks, please use Slido. The details are here. So you go online on slide.do um, and you would type in the code EP19. Um, and then you can also vote for questions and I see which questions are most liked and move up here on my smartphone and then we will try in each block to ask one or two questions coming from the audience uh, through Slido. Um, after that, um, uh, we have 25 minutes for Q&A, uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes for Q&A with you, the audience, uh, where you all uh, hope uh, some of you will have a chance to ask a question. Please do not make comments, long comments and so on, but really ask pertinent questions. Uh, with that, I give the floor to Anne-Sylvain uh, Chassani, um, the world news editor of the Financial Times, to kick us off. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. So, so like, we have a good crowd, very happy about this. Um, uh, Manfred Weber, um, it's my turn to, to, uh, to kick it off. A very general question, maybe, you know, uh, how do you see the place of Europe and what is the vision, your vision for Europe in an age of, you know, economic bullies, you know, between the US and China and at a time when Europe is being threatened of divisions and splintering? How do you see this? Yeah, thank you, first of all, for the invitation and thanks for the interest. Um, well, 2019, for me, it's an historic year. I think uh, the elections are in a really decisive moment of the development of the European Union. We decide whether, whether we believe in compromise, in being Europeans, in finding common solutions, or whether we go back to egoism, even to nationalism. Uh, so I think it's a hist really historic moment of time and having in mind that this is not only a European decision question on the table that has a global dimension for the whole Western world. I believe that, that, the, that the Western societies, uh, we are all experiencing at the moment a period of time where we have so much fundamental developments going on at the same moment of time like never before. We have globalization, we have digitalization, we have demographic development, climate change, migration, a lot of very fundamental changes going on. And a lot of people feel uncertainty. What does this mean for me? Um, and, uh, and that's why we have the feeling of uncertainty in, in all Western societies. And that is bringing us to Donald Trump. That is bringing us to the Brexit situation. That is bringing us to the uncertainty we feel in today's European Union as well. And my answer is, my answer is, we need a new period of, of political leadership. That means, con very concretely speaking, for the European Union, that means the last 10 years were about crisis management, the Euro's crisis, migration crisis, Brexit. And the next five, probably even 10 years, the next decade must be again about optimism, positivism, projects for the future. Make people, make people proud to be Europeans, to look for such projects. That is what we need, so a kind of a new period of, of political leadership from the center of the landscape. Well, that is my feeling and that is what I, what I want to do for Europe. So what would you be your main economic priorities? What would, you, would you be your flagship project, you know, program, measure? Well, on the economic uh, side, uh, uh, let, me, let me start first of all because I'm a candidate from the, from the EPP uh, and we are always based on what 
our predecessors did. So, uh, because we are always in history, let me say, we are always based on, on developments. And you know, Jean-Claude Juncker was a member of CEPP. He is the acting commission president. And having the last years in mind, I would say that uh, the, uh, the 13 million new jobs in the last 10 years, the growth rate, you know, in seven years we have a stable growth rate in all Euro countries and in the European Union. Um, the situation that all countries of the Eurozone are under the 3% uh, 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 deficit criteria, uh, I think we did a great job. And let me say that was an EPP success. It was uh, Enda Kenny, it was Mariano Rajoy, it was Kupasius Coelho, it was uh, even Samaras in Greece with difficult situation. And uh, in Cyprus, uh, uh, we had our, it was our job, let me say, as EPP leaders to do the structural reforms, to do the necessary reforms. I have in mind that I was heavily attacked five years ago when I was a you know, normal candidate for the European Parliament together with Jean-Claude Juncker. I was heavily attacked about the so-called austerity policy. And I want to say to you, after five years, our policy saved and rescued Europe and our policy made Europe now economically successful. So I'm based on this success story. And when I see the, the triangle about what to do to guarantee uh, economic growth, it was about stable budgets. There I think we are on a good way. The second, as the second point was always the reform agenda, so social welfare system, labor markets and all these things. There we have quite a lot still to do, but okay, we are on our way. And the third element was always investment. So how can we create investment? And I think for the next uh, five years, one of the key elements is we have to consider, we have to think about how we can activate in a better way the private money and also the state money we have in today's European mm. Union. And Draghi helps us a lot to have a lot of private money at the moment in the Eurozone present to activate this money for growth and for investments because there we have a lack. Even in the well-doing countries like Germany, Finland, Austria, we have a lack of investments in the infrastructure and all these fields. So we have to find a way to activate more money for the investment. So that would be one of my priorities. But this is, so basically that's what the, um, the Commission has been trying to do under um, Jean-Claude Juncker with the, the, you know, the, the investment, the Juncker plan. So, you know, do you, so you're just advocating doing a little bit more, like, or do you think we need to, you know, go further, be more ambitious? Um, how bolder uh, should the European Union be, um, you know, to, to rival what China is trying to do in artificial intelligence, for example? We need on, on this question of investments for sure also some, let me say, um, convincing flagship projects. Because again, when you speak today with people and in a campaign situation, when I'm out in the, in the, in the countries, I was traveling already since January in my so-called listening tour all over Europe. I already visited 17 member countries of the European Union. When I speak directly with people there, with young students, with mayors, with farmers, with them, when I speak with them, then there is again a lot of concerns and fears and and and, and the question, can we really win the future? That is the atmosphere in mm -hmm. Europe. And that's why as a political leader, again I could say today in the in the discussion here in Brussels, I can say innovation is key and I'm happy that we already have a compromise between Council and, con on, and Commission on, on Horizon, for example, so mm. the biggest research program on this globe is already is already established for the next seven years. So, but that is too theoretical for the people. I give you a concrete example. I'm aware about the background, but let me put a concrete example on the table to make people open for research and innovation. I was presenting in Helsinki when I was nominated as top candidate of CEPP, the idea that we combine all our money, all our research capacity, all our databases, to make a master plan, to create a master plan and fight against cancer. To be the first continent who can give an answer on cancer. I have a lot of researchers who support the idea now. And the method behind, the messaging behind is that only together, the people immediately understand this, only together we can achieve such a big mm. thing to answer cancer. And if we can really do so, then I can be proud to be a European to create a feeling that we Europeans make the world a better place. So we have to look for such kind of flagship projects, which ordinary citizens immediately can understand. 40% mm. of the Europeans will experience cancer in their life. And that's why it's such a clear message, message why innovation is so needed. And we need this kind of flagship projects, like 
50 years ago, people, politicians said, let's build up Airbus, for example. It was also a flagship, technological flagship project for the European yeah. Union. And again, we have to identify now these kind of flagship projects to make it understandable. And only, probably I'm not, I'm not, I'm not clear enough, but when you speak today about people, normal, ordinary citizens about artificial intelligence, because you mentioned this. What is a truck driver thinking when he is sitting in his truck, listening to the radio news, and the radio news rep report about the innovation of a self-driving truck? Hmm. It's only a matter of time whether this will come in five years or seven years or three years. Nobody knows exactly. What is a truck driver thinking? And that is what I mean with is the uncertainty that the people have so much fears in their, in their mind when they hear about this technological development. And we as politicians, we have to open mind. We have to tell people we cannot avoid this. We don't want to avoid this. It's a future perspective and it will be a better world in the future if but, we do it together. Yeah. But, but, but can I ask you, so uh, one big topic is climate change, of course, and it's, uh, it's a massive um, issue and if we really want to get rid of um, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 or earlier, we will have to invest a lot. And we will have to invest in all kinds of infrastructure. And all of that investment will affect the daily lives of citizens, right? Because it's not tr just not true that it will not affect people that currently use their diesel to drive to their work and so on. I mean, all of these people will be affected. So what is your strategy on, on this big topic? So on the one hand, doing the investment, on the other hand, doing managing the social fallout. I mean, is, there a, is this a big priority for you as a new commission president, or would that be a second or third priority? Absolutely. I'm totally committed to our targets, the 2050 uh, zero CO2 economy uh, um, in, the European, in the European Union. So that is our target. That is what we want to achieve. But you correctly said that this is also in in, in interaction with the social perspective and also with the technological uh, achievements or the technological innovation which is needed behind. So that's why um, I'm, I'm clearly committed to what we set already as, 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 as targets and having especially one of the key industries, the car industry in mind, 2030, again, 37.5% uh, reduction is an ambitious goal, it's an ambitious mm -hmm. goal. For me in this regard, it's extremely important to make it, uh, I'm, I'm an engineer from my profession, my background. For me, it's extremely important that we make this as a target, but, we, but the industry must decide how to do it. So it's not our job to set a quota for electric cars, for example. That's not the job of the politicians. The politicians must decide about the reduction of CO2, what the industry has to deliver. How to do it, how to manage this in the best way, in the best professional way. That's up to the technicians, to, to the industry, to the innovation to, to achieve this finally. So clearly a clear commitment to this. And uh, I think we all share this. It's not a party political issue because we all share this, that this is also creating the innovation for tomorrow. We will have the products, we will have the services for the global dimension on fighting against climate change if we are the first uh, on, this, on, this, on this path. But it does require some public investment as well, right? I mean, we need to, uh, to change the infrastructure. We might do more in railway investment and so on and so forth. So, so where do you see the public investment part? Because you mentioned, of course, the European rules and also the national rules do not limit uh, fiscal policy action and fiscal investment, so the austerity and the investment lag is not driven by, uh, by, uh, by let's say, the Schuldenbremse or the, uh, the debt break, but some would see that differently. So do we have enough scope in terms of the rules to actually use public money to do the public investment on climate? Yes, but um, I'm a generation which, is, which deeply believes that debt is not creating growth. So I don't think that uh, with more and more that we have more and more growth. If that would be the case, then we wouldn't discuss the Italian question at the moment uh, on the table. So that's why I believe in stable budgets. Um, you know, um, I think that I'm a generation, I'm 46 years old, I will arrive in a political, um, uh, 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 on a political ground where we cannot do what previous uh, politi political gener gener generations did that they always spent more money than, than they had. That's why I don't believe in this approach. I, I stick to the, to the rules of our European uh, currency um, to limit this and to have a sustainable growth. For the moment, I'm, 
I'm, I'm in this regard happy because generally speaking, again, the Eurozone is under 3% compared with the Americans, the same level of growth, but 6% deficit in the public uh, expenditures of, of, of America. So I think we did a good job to be, to be quite stable in this regard, to have sustainable growth managed into, into today's European Union. And I'm committed to, to also continue with this approach. Uh, that is also, I think, a generally, generational question because we have already such high level of, of, of deficit inside of the public uh, budgets that this cannot last for long. Um, that's why I, I'm committed to this and, you know, there is still enough money there. So we had growth, we have more tax paid in the European Union. So when I look to the countries who are doing very well at the moment, uh, economically, that is not a problem that there is not enough money in the public budget. So the question is, do we spend the money in a future oriented way? That is the question on the table. And there we have to be frank to each other. We have to talk about the situation. We have to speak out loudly about the question, is it better to increase pensions or is it better to invest in the future energy structure of the European Union? I want to add another aspect in this point because you correctly said, okay, Manfred Weber told us that he wants to continue some of the fields where Jean-Claude was already investing. And yes, I'm an EPP politician. That's why it's not a surprise that I like a lot of these things. But I must tell you, in one field, we need much more engagement. And that is the single market. Because in the field of the single market, we had a lack of engagement in the last five years. And the single market is our backbone of our economic strengths of today. We should not, not first of all, look to America and to China. I think we will discuss the issues. That is not the first priority. The first priority is to create more growth among the 440, 450 million Europeans, even without the Brits. We have so much private money. We have so much chances to, to create growth from our own uh, 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 ground on then we should do it. And especially in a lot of fields like, uh, uh, you know, we did some steps on the energy union, but not sufficiently. We did some steps on the, on the digital field, but not sufficiently. And I would say the big field of the services is not yet a real single market there. We have a single market of products, of industrial products, first of all, uh, with common rules, with common standards for the products but we have not yet achieved a real single market on services. Mm. That is not the case. And, there's, and everybody knows that the future economy is about services. That is the future economy, more than about products. And having this in mind, if we can strengthen, let me say, the single market idea, but again on services, then we can create growth without asking anyone else. Uh, and that is what I want to do. Um Perhaps behind this subject is the question of transfers, right? Because if you want to build a, a single market, a more unified, more integrated market, the question of transfers, you know, a fiscal transfers is key. What, what, what is your, your views on, what are your views on that? I mean, we know the German kind of view. Um, would you be ready to, to envisage more transfers? Well, first of all, when you refer to Germany, I think Germany made also in the German public debate, there was a big uh, lack of, uh, of, of broadening the perspective during the economic crisis, during the euro crisis. What I mean with this, there was a lot of discussions about the 3%, about stable budgets, about reform agenda, but there was no awareness about the youth unemployment in the south of Europe. There was no debate in Germany about this. And today, the Germans are wondering themselves, why do we have now populistic movements in Italy going, mm. going, becoming stronger and stronger? That's why I think we have to find a way that everybody uh, understands the European dimension of our today's political approach. Go out of the national box. Please understand the problem of the others as well. That is what we have to do, what politicians on European level have to do. And uh, when you speak about transfers, you know the most important uh, issue in this field is our EU budget. This is a big, a big contribution to solidarity today. I think around 600 billion euros in the regional funds. Uh, in a lot of countries in the Central Eastern European Union, uh, it creates a big contribution to the GDP there. So that is uh, the biggest, let me say, uh, uh, contribution to this. And I want to link this budget thing, because it's again money, it's about technical arrangements, and we speak about regional funds. I want to use it also for my political campaign, and I would want to tell people that I want to give the promise that we fight and work for a Europe 
where nobody is anymore forced to leave his home region only due to economic reasons and to get better salaries. And that is what I dream about. Yeah. What we have to, to tell people what we have as targets in mind, what we want to achieve. And then regional policy is a tool for this. And that means, practically speaking, that in the regions where we have a lack of development, we have to look for special investments. Yes. Like, for example, the next supercomputer should not go again to Paris or to Munich. The next supercomputer must go to Bucharest or to, or to Krakow, for example. Well, we, come to the regional, so is, we come to the regional issues in a minute. Let me perhaps ask one very last quick question on the single market, because you mentioned the single market very prominently, which is here by, by someone on Slido, Todd, Todd Bull. Uh, do we still, unanimity for, uh, still need unanimity for tax policy? which is very much a single market question, right? We have a single market for capital, but taxation is national, so it's quite easy to shift capital income, capital tax income, tax revenues to the country with the lowest uh, tax rates. Do we have to overcome the unanimity? In special cases, yes. I wouldn't say in all the tax issues, because I am also a friend of competition. I'm a man of competition, I like competition, and if a state is well organized, then you have less officials, because your state is well organized with less bureaucracy, then you have less uh, uh, taxation. Uh, and, and that is, I think I love also competition, but in special fields, the most prominent one everybody knows is, 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 is uh, taxation of the t digital giants, uh, which is seen as a very, very unfair thing that every, every small medium enterprise has to pay his taxes uh, on the local level, but uh, the giants uh, are looking for the best place to avoid any kind of taxation. Yeah. That is unacceptable, and that's why in special cases we have to look for a new method. Okay, let's move to the second block, um, which is on trade policy. And if we could just have the slide, uh, the slide on, which shows um, how important trade is, is for the European Union. Um, so this gives you um, the amount of exports um, uh, that the European Union is, is doing. Uh, of course, our intra-EU trade is the most important one. That's right? the argument for the single market. Yes. That's the argument for the single market. But the extra one is also important and, um, and comparable in size to that of China, a little bit less than, uh, than that of the US. Uh, so, so we are coming, you, you suppose you become the commission president and you come uh, uh, to, to face this world of uh, trade animosities that is very strong. I mean, we have a trade war ongoing between between China and the United States. We have a big issue with, um, uh, of course, the US uh, threatening with tariffs um, now on uh, several products in response to Airbus, but before that there was already tariffs on steel and aluminium. There's a threat of tariffs on the car industry, of which uh, Germany, of course, will be very heavily affected, based on very obscure uh, reasoning also. I mean, the security clause uh, is, is, is very obscure. So there's a real, a real threat here that the WTO, the multilateral trading system is, uh, is unraveling, but there's also a threat that the bilateral relations will deteriorate massively. What would be your strategy as Commission President to deal with this uncertainty on trade? The first question is what we internally have to clarify, do we believe still in trade? Huh? That is what we have to answer before we go to the external dimension. Can we achieve further trade agreements? Can we strengthen WTO? But the precondition is that we know what we want. And I say this because uh, a few days ago, a few months ago, the European Commission was presenting the mandate for the negotiations with our American friends. So it's a renewed TTIP, in a way, agreement uh, to, 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 to bond and all, all the tariffs on, on the industrial product, products and, uh, and readiness for talks. And I must tell you that in the European Parliament, you know the Parliament is finally the place to give the consent on all the trade agreements. In the European Parliament, the socialists opposed the socialists opposed to this idea to start dialogue with American friends on trade. So that is for me a key issue in the election campaign. You have to ask yourself: Are you in favor of trade or against? And I must tell you: If you're against, vote for Greens, vote for socialists. And if you're in favor of trade, vote for EPP, because we are the party at the moment who is strongly defending the trade agreements. We were mainly unanimously in favor of the CETA, of the Japan agreement, of Singapore agreement, and the Greens also mainly unanimously against them. And that's why there is a political question for ourselves, first of all, on the table. And to make it clear, election campaign is not only to be theoretically to talk about the next step for Europe. It's also to show the differences between the parties. And people must know that their voice matters, their vote matters. 
if you vote for the socialists, you get, in this regard, a lot of uncertainty. I learned that in two, weeks time, uh, two days' time, uh, 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 Franz Timmermans will be sitting on this chair. Uh, probably you can ask him, because he himself, as vice president, is strongly in favor of trade, but his home group <laughs> is not. So that is what we have to talk about. Again, I believe in trade. I see even the big chance that having the Trump behavior in mind, having the uncertainty in global level in mind, there is a huge opportunity in today's world and also in the next five years for us to, to find a lot of partners on global level who wants to do trade with us, fair and good trade agreements with us. I was also myself when I was traveling around, I was in Mexico, met the president there before we uh, uh, started our dialogue. And you see there really the will of all the partners who see the American problem in a way, huh? Mm -hmm. who, who see the problem, <coughs> let's say, are ready now to, to engage and to invest really in the EU relationship. Because we are the second biggest market. Everybody wants, if you have problems in America, everybody wants to go to Europe. And that's why there is a huge opportunity, a huge window of opportunity for us to, to look for this and, and to, to use this momentum. I would love to see more engagement on WTO level, no doubt about this. That would be the best option for us, to have global standards on trade. But that is not realistic at the moment. That's why the bilateral agreements are, right. are good for us. And then let's include, again, also the element of fair trade agreements, because trade is not anymore about only lowering the tariffs, only um, the tariffs. It's also about uh, the question of regulatory framework, of about common standards, climate change, social standards. That has also to be a little bit involved in the debate when we speak especially with the, third, uh, with the developing right. countries. But, but, uh, so, so more trade agreements with friendly partners, um, I think that's, uh, that's the easy part of the answer. But what about the more difficult part? How do you deal with the difficult partners? Um, a US president that might be even, even more unpleasant than he, than he currently is on, on his trade decisions vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. And of course China, China, a big economic power, much more trade in the future uh, than it does currently and already now. It's, uh, it's uh, almost as big as, as the EU. And China's trade practices, um, I mean, today we have the EU-China uh, summit here in Brussels. I mean, China's trade practices are very heavily criticized uh, in the EU for state subsidization, for forced technology transfer. So how do you deal with the difficult partners, the United States and China? Well, it's uh, sad to see that, 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 that makes us sad that, that America is seen as a problem, but that's a reality. On, on fundamental values, we are still strong partners, no doubt about this. So we have a lot of relationship, uh, economic relationship trade. We believe in some uh, common uh, values. And that's why I think we can achieve things together the way the message of Donald Trump is totally different and we saw it in the last years and uh, and it must also be clear like the commission did already like Jean-Claude Juncker did already on the steel sector it must be clear that uh, when we sit together we are working together as partners on an equal level playing field we are we are equal partners and we cannot be forced to do something that must be clear so if there is one actions one concrete activity against us in the steel, Airbus or car industry, then Europe has to answer, no doubt about this. And uh, that must be a decisive and a, and a strong answer. So don't play with us. We are partners. We want to offer a, a free tariff uh, 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 area together where we, where, we, where, we, where we really take away all the, all the tariffs that, is, uh, that we are ready for this. But let's negotiate, let's be partners, and let's not uh, be threatened, and so on. And on the Chinese side, you know, that's a very fundamental uh, question, because there we are really in a moment of, 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 of um, the last decades, China was a developing country, did a, great, did a great job for a lot of people to, to establish a normal life, a better life for them. So that was a great development, but now China is changing. China is now trying to be not only a developing country, but also a country who is asking for leadership on global level. And that is the change moment we, we experience at the moment. And I would say that uh, this means that we have to implement, and that will also be today the discussion, the fundamental principle of reciprocity. That is the key element in the EU-China relationship. Again, also with China. China is a strong partner on trade, but also on Paris Agreement, climate change. So we have a lot of fields where we are we have a common thinking, a lot of problems where we have uh, 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 
a problematic understanding on human rights and so on, but there are also points where we have a common understanding. And that's why, yes, partnership, but a level playing field on investments, on public, public procurement, on the question of uh, uh, copyright and, and uh, intellectual property rights and so on. That is what we have to find, a common understanding on this. And Europe should be, should be strict on this because China needs at the moment us, having the, EU, uh, the US, China trade war in mind, China needs us more than we need them at the moment. That's why there is a, also an opportunity for us. But um, this, this is not really working. We, ha we had an interview of Cecilia Malmström in the FT recently, basically venting her frustration about how slow and you know progress um, was on, on this you know EU China um, talks about more reciprocity and so on. So, um, so how you know in a way it's isn't isn't Europe you know isn't Europe a little bit hypocritical because you know in a way we're pretty much happy that we we're not unhappy that the US is playing back up and you know the bully. Right, it's, it's, it's not working. So how do we how do we make it work? And my other question is, you know, Italy and some other question, other countries in Central and Eastern Europe are very tempted to establish close links um, with China through um, China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. What do you think of this? It um, it makes no sense to make on the procedure, on the way to negotiate with China, it makes no sense to copy now the Donald Trump approach. So to be more aggressive, to stop trade or whatever, so to impose tariffs, that is not the way Europe should, should deal with this. Europe should always try to convince, to argue, even if it takes a little bit longer, but to add to the already existing crisis between America and China, another trade crisis, having in mind that our today's lack of growth is not about innovation, it's not about single market, it's mainly about trade, Brexit and Trump and so on. That's why it, having the economic uncertainty for the next months in mind, for the next years in mind, I wouldn't go for any kind of, uh, of, of Trump approach in the relationship. That's why let's insist in, in talks and, 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 and discussion to each other. And on the other hand, again, the Chinese have also a lot of interests. Uh, we, can, we, we should not only sit there and wait what happens, we can do our job. Uh, I, th I think and I believe that, uh, that uh, on the question of uh, public procurement, uh, the European Union can be clear. If the European companies cannot be fully present in China, then the Chinese cannot fully be present in Europe. And the question of uh, on investment shield, if we cannot agree today, and that seems to be the case, uh, on this uh, investment uh, uh, agreement, uh, then Europe must uh, strengthen uh, the investment shield. We have now in place already the legislation that we have a screening on European level. That is a good first step. But the next step is obviously that we also have on European level the readiness, the legal opportunity to stop some investments if we see a state-driven activity behind and not only a private investment behind. And the third point is a public debate about uh, the European champion, you know, about Siemens Alstom case. I was very clear on this. I think we have to upgrade the today's competition law into the modern world. And that means for me in very special cases, don't get me wrong. So I believe in competition. I believe that competition brings good product services and uh, a cheap prices finally so that is what 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 is competition all about and i love this uh, but uh, in special cases we have to we have to understand that competition is already on a global scale on a global level and that's why we also have to think about where are our key industries and we have to give them the opportunity mm. to to establish let me real global champions of this so we come to the competition question in a, in a minute uh, in more detail, but here's a question by a person called Gregory. Um, the export-oriented model of Germany and now of the euro area makes it very vulnerable to external shocks. What should be done to make Europe less vulnerable to external shocks? Do we have to strengthen internal demand, uh, increase our imports? I mean, how do we deal with our dependence on exports as a source of growth? Well, you... 
will not be surprised when I say I look already from a perspective on a, on a European uh, economy because uh, the German economy is so interlinked to the rest of the European Union, so we have to think that the German car industry, everybody speaks about the German car industry, but please see the impact for Czech Republic, for Hungary when we speak about the German car industry. So that is not any more a, a key German industry, it's a European industry. And, and we have a lot of French interests which are European interests today, and this is the same for Spain, though that's why we see already a European dimension behind. I see it in this way. And, um, and, uh, and the question of economic shocks, external economic shocks, well, first of all, we will not change from one moment to the other our business model. I talked already about the strengthening of single market, so domestic, let me say European-based creation of, uh, of, of a single market, of a common market which can create growth, so without export-import, but our own growth. And that must be the future. There we have to do a lot. But, um, but when it is about this, uh, this uh, uh, external dimension and the question of, of uh, economic shocks, I think what we learned out of the crisis in 2007, 8, 9, 10, what we learned out of this crisis was that we were not prepared on balancing, on counterbalancing, let me say, these external shocks. That was one of the lessons we learned, but we are not yet arrived to a solution. You are aware about the debates in the European Council and the uh, finance and ECOFIN, ECOFIN uh, uh, group about how can we manage to have an own budget for stabilizing in some very special cases, let me say the economic situation, if a country is not responsible for the developments, like it was the case in the Lehman Brothers uh, development in some, of the, in some of the countries, Spain for example and others. So that's why I'm absolutely committed to such a mechanism, we need such a mechanism, and if we can combine it also in the regular work, on the normal, let me say, if we have no crisis times, if we can also link it to the semester, to the need of reforms, to make it more attractive for the countries, to say, yes, I'm ready for reforms, I do the necessary steps, and politically speaking, again, we are doing campaign and not only, let me say, academic discussions, in a campaign situation, to show people that if, when there is a crisis arriving, Europe is not only the bad guy who tells you what to do on reforms, that Europe is also the good guy who helps you to do the reforms. Huh? That is a political dimension behind. And I'm absolutely committed to this. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that there were some st steps in the, in, the, in, the, in the European Council already, already made, but we are not yet there. And one probably more technical aspect behind this is that I think, I think if we have the semester, if we have the uh, whole question of uh, supervising the euro, the deficit criteria, if we have all these things in the hand of the European Commission, it makes, from my understanding, no sense to establish now on the ESM, on the European Monetary Fund, an additional supervision mechanism in an intergovernmental way. So I think we should do it in a European Union way, and that means to add the additional tasks also to the European Commission tasks. Do you want to introduce uh, the, the third yeah. block? Okay, so let's let's move to the third block, which is uh, about regional divergences. If we if we could have the map, um, which is a map showing <coughs> how different regions in Europe have have fared over the last uh, 15 years. Um, and as you will see, um, there is a lot of red here, uh, and the cursor is being moved away so that you see Andalusia is not doing well, um, the south of Spain, the south of Italy, Greece is not doing well. Significant parts of this island called United Kingdom um, are not doing well, but then there's of course also France outside of Paris, where there's a lot of a lot of red here, um, and then there's the east of Europe that is of course converging, so there is growth, um, but uh, some studies also show that the growth doesn't arrive in the bottom 50 percent. So this is the picture you inherit as a Commission president. How do you deal? with these regional differences, regional tensions, regional divergences in economic performance? Well, it's also a kind of a map of our political problems on them. Uh, we have the Yellow West, we have the Brexit, we have in Italy the populism. It's also a map of our political challenges. Probably the only promising uh, perspective is, if I may say, 
as a Greek perspective because uh, neo democracia with Greek Kyriakos Mitsotakis is doing very well though. So Greece is already in a kind of a of a post-populist uh, period of time because they experienced already what it means to vote for Tsipras and what they get for this, uh, nearly, nearly nothing, no growth, no perspective for the country. But it's really also a map of our political challenges uh, which we have in the European Union on the table. And you know what Europe can do. Europe can do a lot of the discussion of regional funds, of regional investments. When we speak about this, I already mentioned this, and it is about nobody is forced anymore to leave his home region due to economic circumstances. But we have to do this hand in hand with the national level, because when we speak about the social question of Europe, um, I, I read a lot at the moment about this. Also in the election campaign, we consider and we discuss a lot about this. And I admire very much what Marianne Tyson did in the last years about some minimum standards, some common understanding about how a social market economy should look like on European level. But you know our tools to really create social <coughs> justice inside of our societies are very, very limited from a European point of view. And I also want to be a commission president which shows respect to the national level. So we have to do it together. So we have a lot of colleagues in the member states on national level in the parliaments there who have sent the, ch the chance to look for for justice inside of their societies, about the under 50%, uh, uh, let me say, part of the societies, and it is about the economic strengths. But the main tool, again, is for sure the question of, uh, of regional policy, and there is a lot of money, and there probably we have to think about, again, about how to manage this. I think one change is from the previous period, from the previous MFF period, to the next money uh, budget, budgetary period, is that we are looking much more, not only on the GDP, we are looking much more on, on the need, on the demand, on the question of innovation, on the question of climate change, uh, uh, CO2 neutral economy financing and so on. And that is, from, from my understanding, a good development, also for these underperforming regions. Should there be um, some sort of um, criteria around the rule of law? Do you think that regional funds should be tied up to a, a good, comp good compliance? to rule of law? You know, I'm absolutely convinced about this. So the idea from uh, Günther Oettinger, first of all, on the budgetary side, but I would even, it would even uh, strengthen this, uh, is a good approach. Well, the rule of law is a fundamental question for us. And, and, it, it, and it is, a, for the Europeans, it's a tragedy to see that we have to speak again about rule of law in Europe. Normally, when you arrive in Europe, Copenhagen criteria, when you arrive in Europe to become a member of the European Union, you have to accept everything, you have to implement everything, what we believe in as one fundamental values of Europe. But, uh, but afterwards, nobody can, uh, let me say, is checked anymore, or is assessed anymore, whether he really complies and whether he really implements the fundamental principles. And there we have a lack. And that's why having also in mind that the Article 7 is not really functioning in a proper way, that's why I would present a binding rule of law mechanism for the European Union um, to, uh, to make a neutral assessment. That's the first step. So to ask, for example, a body of former judges of the European Court of Justice or National High Court uh, judges to ask such an independent structure to give us a yearly assessment about rule of law with mainly three criteria: fight against corruption, independence of the judiciary, and media freedom. There are three key criteria for a modern society. And having this in mind, I would look for such a yearly assessment, like we do the semester, uh, the economic side. Also a rule of law semester, in a way, to make such an independent assessment. And then I would, I would say, I would promise as a commission president that all the problems this independent uh, 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 body would put on the table will be quasi-automatically transmitted to or, or, or put it on the table of the, of the European Court of Justice. So that we have, and that the Polish case, we saw that the European Court of Justice ruling is quite powerful tool. It helps us a lot to keep the rule of law alive. And these two steps can be managed even without legal changes. So as a commission president, I can always install an independent advisory body. No doubt about this. I will do so. And I can always uh, put things on the table of the European Court of Justice without any legal changes. But these two things I promise and I will do even without legal changes. And the third element in such a rule of law mechanism is about 
to, uh, to have sanctions in the hand of the European Union? That is your question about can we use the funds for, 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 for sanctions? And I will do so, I want to do so, but therefore you know we need a legal change of the budgetary rules of the European Union to make it possible. Therefore, you need uh, a debate in the Council level. But I, but I think I will enjoy this debate. Imagine, imagine if I would go to the European Council and there, everybody who is sitting there, all the leaders of our member states, tell us every day, so I, I have no problems with rule of law in my country. Everything is going well. And I would say, if this is the case, you will have absolutely no problem to make an independent assessment and to use the funds for sanctions. Eh? So I would have fun to, to present such an initiative on the council side. Let's see how it will develop. But again, to make it again serious, it's a fundamental question. We, don't, we cannot ask the Chinese to accept our rules if we if we are not 100% in, uh, implement them in, in today's Europe. You would have a fun conversation with Viktor Orban. Absolutely. I, was, I had already a lot of funny discussions with Viktor Orban, I must tell you. And that is, that is one of uh, the EPP questions on the table. You know that uh, um, we were very firm. We made a suspension. That means that Viktor Orban, the Fidesz uh, party, has no voting right anymore, has no right to present candidates for posts, and has no right even to participate in meetings. So tomorrow when we have the meeting of the EPP leaders as a prep meeting for the council, Victor Orban is not invited there. So he lost all the possibilities to influence the EPP decision-making process. And that was for me key. I presented this solution. That was for me key because I want to underline that uh, the EPP, we are the Christian Democrats, we are the party of Adenauer, the Gaspari Schumann, we are the founding fathers of today's European Union, and for us there is no debate about in which direction we go. And that was the clarification process, the necessary clarification process. Franz Timmermans has the Romanian socialists, has the Maltese so, uh, uh, socialists, where we, Muscat, where we had the killing of journalists, which are not yet clarified, where we have uh, investigate, investigate journalists between state and mafia contacts and so on. So Slovakian case on the table. In the liberal team we have some Romanian party, Babish, I don't know, you can talk about a lot of issues on the table and, uh, and uh, it's not a party political issue which is on the table. It's a very fundamental question for Europe and I hope that we as those who believe in this fundamental values and, and base for our European dream uh, that those who believe in this dream are, are, are guarantee this common base. And that's why we need this independent rule of law mechanism for the future. Com coming back to, um, to the picture, the regional growth picture, and you know, what, what do we do? I mean, so you mentioned the budget, you mentioned, uh, of course, the importance of rule of law, national institutions. What about the Eurozone, the functioning of the Eurozone as such? I mean, a part of this story here is, um, is also a story of um, incomplete, uh, an incomplete monetary union where banking union isn't in place, really. It's only half in place. Capital markets are fragmented. Our fiscal policy reactions remain basically based on national decisions. There's no coordination. Um, what would you do, I mean, really, to, uh, uh, to help improve the functioning of the Eurozone? Well, again, let me start with, with, uh, with praising in a way what we achieved. You, you know about the results. I think that was an extremely difficult situation 10, 8 years ago. And when you see today's Euro landscape, we are in a much better situation. So unemployment rate and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I see, I see a few key elements. One element is for me that uh, we did a lot on the banking union. It's not yet finalized, but we did a lot. And when I speak with the friends from the, from the banking sector, then the first message I hear is, please make a, a kind of a, of a check of the already existing regulation. Because it is also seen from a lot of stakeholders in this field, from a lot of uh, 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 partners in this field, as a burden, as a big burden for our industry to get, to get stronger uh, and, 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 and to grow. And that's why I would say in a lot of fields we need a kind of a, also of a checking of the current legislation. How does it work? Do we, is there a need of, a, of, 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 of changes and so on and so forth? So I would, I would say this. As a second element on the necessary reforms, I think that the uh, 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 ESM question is for sure one of the key elements. Again, let me say it, we 
we can discuss it from a more technical point of view. That means that uh, in the future, let me say, we need the experience, the knowledge of ESM in a broader way for the future, although the banking sector and so on. Um, but uh, stabilizing banking uh, problems, if there are uh, some of them. But I would say it in a more political way. And that means when I'm in front of people, I tell them, 10 years ago, we had the need as Europeans, as Eurozone, to go to the IMF and to ask the IMF to help us with money and with knowledge. And uh, uh, 10 years ago, that was not a major problem because there we had Obama and so on in, in, in the White House. There we had partners on global level who helped us a lot, and that was not a big problem for us. That helped, even helped us there again. But today, I tell the Europeans, in the future possible crisis times, hopefully they will never come, but if they come, I, as a European politician, I want to be independent from the White House. I want to stand on our own feet if we have problems. And that's why to establish a European monetary fund is this next step for the Eurozone, to be really independent. From a money point of view, from a strength point of view, no doubt we are strong enough to defend ourselves, to recapitalize ourselves and to find good solutions. And the knowledge is also there now in the ESM field, in the EMF. Again, I would wish to make it as a European institution, intergovernmental European institution, but that is a more technical question afterwards. And the third element probably is, uh, is for sure the stability of our banking sector, still the, the question of uh, the non-performing uh, loans and all these questions. Again, a lot of things uh, already were, uh, are on a good way, so the, the figures are better. But we have still a lot of problems inside on special markets, Cyprus, for example, the Italian figures and so on. We have still a lot to do. And uh, I would say that is the third element on the table. To, to follow up perhaps on the, uh, on the European Monetary Fund, which is also something that Emmanuel Macron is backing, but obviously people have different views of what should be a European Monetary Fund. Would you, would you think that um, a stabilization mechanism is also part of its mandate, you know, what do you think? And emotionally, do you think that Macron's budget, you know, Eurozone budget, is already dead? Or can be revived? Well, um, let me start with a positive thing. <laughs> that is, for sure, the stabilization mechanism. There I fully back the general idea behind, uh, also on the idea to link, link it not only on the crisis management times about this, uh, uh, this stabilizing factor when we have an external effect, but also in the normal period of time, to link it to the master, to link it to the reform agenda. I think that would absolutely be a positive thing. I would wish to see this mechanism in that of the EU budget. It makes no sense to establish again a new kind of national parliamentarians to come once a year together to make the budget a control job of such a new institution. We have a budget control, and that is in the European Parliament. There we have a budget control committee. So let's not du duplicate uh, uh, infrastructure or, or institutions. That's why I believe in the in the uh, communitarian method on European level. So it's dead. But <laughs> no, no, it's not that. No, no. The, the, again, the stabilizing uh, uh, mechanism is, is a great idea. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. But uh, I must tell you, when you ask me, I can give you an answer on behalf of the EPP. Because we have in the group a clear position on this. We have, a, we have made, we made a very uh, clear paper on how our euro policy will look like in the future. You can imagine there were a lot of discussions between our Finnish and Italian and and Greek and German friends, but we agreed on this idea that we are in favor of this. I say this again because we are in election campaign. Let me come again back to this. It's not an academic discussion. And I must tell you that I'm wondering myself sometimes what is the liberal position in this regard. You see, we have, um, first of all, we have seven candidates on the liberal side, so it's not so easy to, to understand whom should we ask when we want to have a position. But more important is that we have Macron on the one side and Rutte on the other side. So please tell me what is the approach of the Liberals. Please tell me. I have no idea. When I vote for Liberals, what do I get? What do I get? You can easily see in the manifesto of the EPP what I say publicly. What was the voting behavior of the EPP group in the last five years? You can easily assess what EPP position is all about. But you have no idea what the Liberal position is all about in the Euro crisis. Uh, uh, management, and that is what I what I want to show a little bit that we are we are sometimes a little bit the the boring party. No? The EPP is the old traditional boring party in the European Union, probably I don't know, hopefully not, but <laughs> sometimes it's seen in this way. 
but sorry, we have a common European idea behind. We had, for example, for my post as being the lead candidate, we had a competition between two candidates. It was Alex Stubb, Manfred Weber, standing on a podium, making a speech, presenting myself. That is what politicians normally must do, to try to convince. And then we had a secret ballot. More than 1,000 delegates went to the secret ballot box and voted for Alex or for me. And then there was an outcome. And then I have demanded to speak on behalf of the EPP family. And there in Helsinki, there were nine members of the council already present. So Andrei Plenkovic, Leo Faradka, Angela Merkel, Sebastian Kurz, so nine members of the council were present there. And that's why we have a common understanding about what is to do now and what, are, what is the plan behind. And having now election campaign in front of us, I really ask all of the others to be consistent, to be clear in their programming and their, in their positioning, because only then we can do what is needed today. We can start with a lively and strong and ambitious uh, competition between the parties that people get really an understanding what are the different parties fighting for, standing for, arguing for, and then people decide. That is about what I believe in, this democratic race. We must start now. We'll, we'll, come, we'll come back to the politics. Uh, Thank you so much. Um, but uh, we're going to um, now um, talk about competition and industrial policy. And you said something earlier about, you know, that you'd be um, happy to consider European champion, champions or even bending the rules of, of you know, mergers and competition. Uh, in special cases, but you know there are always special cases. You could argue, and isn't there a, a risk of politicizing uh, the competition um, policy of the Commission, which you would have to um, to preside over? You know, when you ask about this politicization question, I give you one example first from an other field. I started five years ago as group leader of the EPP group. And I must tell you, I arrived here in this post, let me say, with the thinking of rules are rules and must be implemented in a more bureaucratic way when it was about the Euro crisis. That was my starting point, because I believe in rule of law and rules and so on. But I learned, I must tell you, I learned that the approach of really establishing a political commission is a good thing. I tell you, I was the first meeting I had as group leader. We were in Albufera with the group meeting. The first meeting after this, I was elected as group leader in Albufera. There, Papa pa 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 Coelho was there, the former prime minister of Portugal. And I had a bilateral with him. And he told me, Manfred, I'm an EPP leader, and I will implement all the rules. I want to have a stable budget. I want to have growth. I do the necessary reforms on labor market, on pensions, and all these things. No doubt about this. But I tell you. I, as an elected Prime Minister of Portugal, was sitting in the whole debate about the program for Portugal, about the austerity policy. I was sitting next to one official from the ECP, another official from the Council, uh, from the Commission, and another official from the IMF. As an elected Prime Minister, I was sitting next to three officials who dictated me what I have to do. And that is not a question of, that is not a way of respectful behavior. He's an elected Prime Minister of Portugal, and then he should negotiate with an elected politician on European level. Jean-Claude Juncker changed this. He was heavily criticized in my country, in Germany, about this, that with Tsipras, the decisive moment for the future of Euro-Greece relationship, uh, Jean-Claude himself negotiated the things. That has a lot to do with question of, we talk about pensions, we talk about people, we don't talk about technical things. We talk about the budget for a state that has a lot to do with people, with their lives. And having this in mind, I think we have to allow the European Commission to behave as a political body, because we are not bureaucrats. We but, are not but technicians. Also, we are not diplomats. But also in competition. And, so and if you take a same. Siemens Alstom case, for example, you tweeted yeah, about exactly. it very strongly. I mean, so would you like to like the council to have a veto on a decision that the well, commission let's, president let's, is doing? Let's consider about the mechanism. We can talk about the mechanism. But what I must say is that the competition law, the competition legislation of today's European Union was made about 20, 30 years ago in a totally different world. We had with America a partner who was working more in favor of free trade and open markets than we did it in these times. They believed more in competition than we did it. Huh? So we learned it from the Americans to do it in this way. Today, America is not anymore behaving in this way. Not anymore behaving in this way. 
And then we have China arriving on global level, who is not anymore a developing country, who is a real global industrial uh, service in all the fields, a real competitor, strong competitor towards us, with another uh, a market behind them. And that is the new world we are in. Again, I don't want to attack anyone on the question of uh, on our competition law. I believe in competition. But we have to behave more politically, because China is behaving politically, having the industries, the key industries for China in mind. The Americans are behaving more and more industrial, uh, industri industri interest oriented, having North Stream 2 discussion in mind. Sorry, it's about in interests uh, uh, on, the, on, this, on this level. And having all these steps in mind, I think we have to know that we are arriving in a new world. That does not mean we are giving up on our principles, that we have to adapt some of the new developments. And that again makes for me, make it for me clear that we need in special cases, together with national and European level, to have the opportunity to allow some mergers if it is needed for establishing and in establishing uh, global champions. Special cases. And the precondition for this is, sorry, but the precondition for this is that we need on European level also a common understanding what are our key industries. That is not yet the case, that we have a common understanding what is decisive for the future of our European uh, economy uh, in the next upcoming decades. So you're advocating for exceptions? For example, Siemens Alstom should be an exception? Or do you think that we should change the rules? And you know, we, uh, Margaret Fustager, you know, rightly pointed out that if we had bended the rules to allow Alstom Siemens, the, the Siemens merger, we, she wouldn't have been able to find Google, um, you know, because if, the, if you take, if you, if you define the market as the global market, then Google is not dominant. So, um, so again, to come back, you know, practically speaking. I'm, I'm, I'm still wondering why Google is not dominant. They are no, more dominant it's not dominant on the global scale. If you, if okay, you take the know. global market, Google is competing with Yandex in Russia and with uh, Baidu in China. So you just cannot find, you, you know, you cannot demonstrate uh, the dominance of Google. So, uh, you, know, we're be, you know, we're entering uh, uncharted territory. Um, so practically, but how do you do that? Question, the key question is, under the 30 top uh, uh, digital giants. None of them is an European one. Look to the financial market. How many big uh, 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 banks do we have in Europe who really work on a global scale? How many? Look to the look to the key industries we have today. Even on, on some of the uh, uh, some of the key industry which we find define today as the key industries, we are not anymore the global champions. That we are losing ground. We are losing down ground every day. But that's not that, down to competition policy. I that mean, is it's down to the fact that we don't invest, isn't it? No, it's also a question of scale. It's also a question of size. You know, on the digital field, for sure, the biggest problem is, and that is what we work on, to create really a digital single market. That is because Spotify went to New York. Huh? Mm. After Sweden, huh? they went to New York. Uh, because they had much, much bigger market in New York with one, the same app, you have 350 um, exactly. million uh, consumers. That is about single market, no doubt about this. But also in the rest of the other fields, if we don't see that in some markets we haven't any more a real European competition, we have already a global competition. I give you a very powerful, from my understanding, a strong example. That is Airbus. Huh? Uh, if if you would if you would uh, let me say see this as, a, as, a, as, a, as an, an example. We have only one European company, a real global champion, in building up a an, 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 an civil uh, plane. Uh, and, uh, that, is, that is what we are doing there. And uh, I don't know whether uh, that uh, establishment of such a uh, big company like Airbus would be possible under today's legislation. I don't know whether this would be possible. But, but again, that is what we have to consider. We have to work for the Airbuses of the future in all the other sectors, where we only have one company in Europe, and nobody would complain that we have uh, unlimited market, we have Boeing and others. And that will also be the case tomorrow in the train sector. That will be the case. China defined this, the, the traffic sector as a key industry for them. That is a, the, the, the idea of the Chinese government. And that's why we shouldn't be naive in which world we will live in 10, 15, 20 years time. And I want to have more Airbus uh, companies in the European Union who are on a global level so competitive and so strong. Again, exemptions. Nobody is attacking the principle behind. 
and the mechanism we can really assess, we can really think about how to make the mechanism to identify the key areas where we need such a, such a possibility, but I see the need. So veto, for example, a veto for the, um, the council? That work? Well, I, I, as, a next, as a possible next commission president, I don't like vetoes from the council. I must exactly. Tell you, but, <laughs> but again, let's let's assess how the mechanism will work afterwards. It's, I think in the campaign, it's important to talk about the principle. Huh? The Liberals West are strongly defending the current uh, legal situation, and I think there is a need to change something to make it more political. And sorry, but the Euro question was an example for for the way that Europe, the Commission, the European political level must behave politically. That was my, my example for sure. this. So, so, um, so you're criticizing um, Margaret Verstager's decision on, on Simisatsum? No, I don't, I don't criticize because that is on the current legal base absolutely what she had to do. No doubt about this. Also Jean-Claude Juncker, you have to respect legislation, but I propose to change the legislation to, to do another way for the next level. You, you, in your program, you, you, um, you're putting forward the idea of you know Europe being more protective. Is that is that not a, the same word as protectionist? Again, look to the global level. I, I can tell you. I can, exp, uh, can describe the the experience in my region in Bavaria. We had with the investments on KUKA, one of the key. Um, uh, 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 robotics. companies on robotics, uh, especially in the car industry. The Chinese invested 100%, they bought it, now they have a new CEO. And what we see there, what you can read every, every time in the, in the business newspapers, is that the, that the knowledge and the, and the technological experience is going to China. That is a reality. And sorry, that is not a normal private investment. We shouldn't be naive in this field. Huh? Nobody can really 100% assess where is the money from when a Chinese sure. company is investing here? Is it state aid? What, what is the background behind? Nobody can really assess it in a proper way. And that's why we shouldn't be naive. We should define our key industries and we should strengthen them to make them globally competitive with a single market as a precondition, not it's clear. But secondly, also to try to defend them when there is a strategic be investment behavior behind. And what I'm simply asking for is, Let's give the Europeans the chance to defend our industries if needed, if we see there an unfair investment behavior behind. And that is already the case. That is not a thing which is arriving sure. in the future. That is already the case. So what would you be the next Airbus for you? Which industry should, you know, we should be thinking of? Is it you know, the naval industry or defense? What, where, where, where is the next Airbus? Well, um, I see, I, for myself, I, I spoke already about uh, medical care, about cancer and so on. I see there is a real a real good chance for us. We have a lot of knowledge and it's a very positive scene uh, research field. Uh, I don't want to mention further ones. But you know, we had already the agreement on Horizon, what I said already. There we define already some flagship projects where we identify the future research, uh, let me say, key priorities. Uh, that is a good understanding on this. But let me, let me try to say also more political in a more political way, I was in my listening tour in Portugal, in, in, in Porto, and I met in the evening with young students there, and I spoke with them about their, their how do they feel, because they are, as young students in Portugal, they are the first, uh, the first generation after austerity, after the big damage on, on, on Portugal uh, happened 10 years ago, and I spoke with them. First, one fascinating thing was that one of the students told me that uh, compared with his parents, the parents had no umbrella when the rain started, when the austerity, when the, when the crisis started. But they grew up as a generation who always had the feeling of there was a lot of changes going on and we know how to manage crisis things. It was so positively to see. And, and then they told me that they have they have in their generation so much fascinating good ideas for, for, for startups, for to being innovative and so on. So I have no doubt that the young generation of the Europeans, the young generation on this continent, had enough creativity, enough ideas for, for finding good, good innovative ideas and projects for the future. I have no doubt about this. It's about 
the, the conditions, about the, the common ground which we have to establish as, as politicians and then they will build up a next, a next success story for Europe. I have no doubt about this. Just perhaps one last question on this um, industrial policy front. Um, there's this huge backlash against Huawei, the Chinese you know, um, uh, manufacturer, technology manufacturer uh, in the US. The US is saying it's a major threat, a national security threat. Do you think that, the, that Europe is too naive um, and too, too, you know, too lenient towards uh, Huawei? Well, that is not a political question. First of all, that's a technical question. So the technicians must tell us, is the, is the, is the, uh, the, is the infrastructure uh, capable to be, uh, to, be, to be installed in an independent way? Because the problem behind this, is there a need of having, let me say, uh, uh, um, um, to store all the data in China or something like this, like the like Apple is doing this with America with our data? Huh? Is there a need to have such a such a? If we can establish an, an Huawei infrastructure, which is guaranteed that all the data are stored here in in, in the European Union on our uh, on our uh, soil with our rules, then we can create an independent infrastructure. So. Again, that's more a technical question for me. Um, and uh, the big problem behind is, again, that we have no European uh, company anymore who can deliver on the 5G technology. That is my biggest problem behind. And then, then I have to say we have to do something with investments, with building up the next Airbus and that's field. So. And that way we have, to, we have to invest a lot. Airbus wouldn't have been possible without state investment, sorry. And that's why we have to invest in these fields. We have to consider about new rules for, for all these investments. And that is the biggest, uh, the biggest problem yet. I think we are coming to the end of the four blocks, um, but we still have a lot of questions here on Slido, and we also want to get questions from the audience. But let me ask one question on Slido, which got 12 likes. So it's uh, one of the top questions. Um, yesterday evening, the UK has accepted the necessity to hold elections in May. If they get the extension, this might lead to a distortion of EU results. What is your comment? Poor. <laughs> well, I, I think, I thought that the decision of the European Council last time was a clever one. So I said, okay, we will prolong, we will extend, but uh, you have to find a majority for the treaty. And if you cannot find a majority for the treaty, you have to come back to the next council tomorrow. You have to come back to the council and give us a plan about the future. Both things are not clear uh, to, make it, uh, to make it soft. And, uh, and, uh, and, and that's why, let me say, for me, my criteria was always, and I, and I argue for this inside of CEPP, family with the head of governments and so on. No prolongation without clarification. Please be, the Brits are our friends. And as friends, it's not too much to ask, please tell us, tell us the truth. What do you want? What do you want to achieve? It's not too much. But I, I guess they don't know. And that's why, that's why <laughs> yeah, but, but that's why the prolongation is the only tool we have to push them a little bit. <laughs> I don't want to be too hard, but to push them a little bit for, please come now to an end, please clarify. And the talks are going on, and nobody can really say that in Great Britain the Brexit case is such a new debate that uh, you have, first of all, the need of a long discussion, because everything is already discussed since years in Brexit, huh? really. So it's a question of political will to come to decisions, that is the point. Mm. And that's why uh, I think uh, no prolongation without clarification is a fair, is a fair point, is a fair point. Brexit is also an issue for us, not only for the Brits, it's also a question for us. And secondly, I still think that a country who is leaving the European Union cannot have a major say about the future of the European Union. That is what I think, what I can explain to citizens in Madrid, in Helsinki, in Bavaria. Eh? That is what I can explain to people. And if the Brits have in Council, Commission and Parliament a big say, they are a big country, they have a big say in the future of the European Union, it's not easy to, to pass a message to the people all over Europe. I think it is fair to ask the Brits, please clarify the situation before people, the 440 million Europeans, will go to their, uh, their ballot boxes. So if no clarification, no deal? Well, everybody, everybody must do its best to avoid a hard Brexit. 
But the answer to avoid a hard Brexit is in the field of London. Okay. Is in the field of London. And let me be again clear on the question of why are we defending, why I do, why I defend this treaty so heavily. Because this treaty is not a technical approach. This treaty in includes the idea that I defend the freedom of movement as a basic fascinating idea for Europe, that everybody lives on a free continent, that everybody of us can choose wherever he wants to live, without a politician or a bureaucrat telling him about any kind of quota. It's a and I defend this. And I defend the question that there is no border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. I defend this, because the violence is coming back after the <coughs> uh, Good Friday Agreement and so on. And that's why we defend the agreement, not because it is an agreement. We defend this agreement because there are a lot of values included. There are a lot of fundamental considerations included. And that's why there is no room for, uh, again, renegotiation on this. And that's why I think stick to the agreement, no participation, uh, and hopefully we have questions. Have clarification. Yes. So I, I think uh, the lady here in front, then the young gentleman there, and the gentleman there. That's my three first, uh, please. Thank you very much. Since it was my question, uh, <laughs> do you allow me to add something? We fully agree, all of you, all of us, we fully agreed on the position that there is, if there is no clarification, no extension. It seems, though, that Ireland, which will be most affected by a cliff-edge Brexit, is now saying we won't forgive anyone who will push uh, Britain to an exit without agreement. So tomorrow, they might decide to let them participate in the elections. And they get, they'll get out immediately after the 30th of June, which might, though, change what the rest of Europe chooses. Okay, we collect So questions. that is a very Thank big political uh, difficulty, especially for your group. Thank, thank you. Yes, thank you. Then the young uh, the young gentleman there in the back on the left. Yes. Thank you. Christoph, oh, sorry. Christoph Schulze from E.ON. Um, I want to, <clears throat> sorry, I want to come back to the energy and climate policy. And you strongly committed yourself and your future commission to the zero carbon economy by 2050. Is it in favor, or are you in favor of a carbon price outside of the ETS to okay. tax yes. also carbon? Thank, thank you. Uh, then here the. So my name is Carl Dolan from Transparency International EU, and first of all, let me thank you in person for signing our election pledge, which we uh, published today, including commitments on anti-corruption and the rule of law. But the other part of that pledge was Im improvements to the transparency of lawmaking here in Brussels. And what would your first priority be uh, to improve the transparency of legislation here in the EU, noting that, as a hint, uh, talks and negotiations on the transparency register, the lobby register, broke down earlier this week? Thank you. Thank you. So we take those three. Yes, on the uh, last point on the lawmaking and the transparency behind, I would say the biggest, uh, let me say, problem in this regard is council. So we have no idea what is happening there, especially when it is about the preparation of the official council meetings. So there is a big need to clarify, let me say, further steps. I would be ready to engage again on the, on the uh, talks between the three institutions to find common understanding about transparency, probably even upgrade what we did already on, in, this, in this regard. For my institution, I would say that we can always do things better, but I would say the European Parliament is already a very transparent institution. That is also part of the DNA of members of a parliament, because as a member of a parliament, you want always to tell the journalists what you have done. So that's why everybody is very active in, trend, in, in passaging the messages and, 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 and about the content. The second thing is about CO2. Um, I, I don't see a lot of need of new tools. Huh? We have some regulatory framework in special industries, car industry, for example. But I don't see a lot of uh, need of new tools for achieving our CO2 uh, goals. Uh, it's a question whether we strengthen the tools we have already established. 
And, uh, and the key element behind this is for sure the question how we can establish a European energy market because uh, we are lacking a lot of uh, years behind. And the final point about uh, European elections, everybody knows that Ireland is the most um, affected country. I must tell you that when, I, when I'm in Ireland, when I speak with Leo Faradka and all the friends there, EPP family, then, then Ireland has really the feeling, got the feeling in the last years what it, what it brings you when you are part of a strong family. Because they saw that the Irish interests are not anymore only Irish interests, they are supported by 27 countries. So uh, my main message was always, we all are Irish in this regard. So that was our message. But that is not only uh, 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 the case when you're talking about the advantages, that is also the case when you have to, to, to take the burden, let me say, of, of being part of the big team. So both things are, are, are together. And uh, let me be very clear, uh, the European elections is not about, it's not about party politics in this regard, because you, you mentioned this. It's about the question whether I can explain such things to the citizens. And again, we are campaigning. I have to go to people who don't share the same knowledge of information like we do, and a lot of people outside of, uh, of Brussels, of those who are working on this and trying to find good solutions, that's our way to do things. A lot of people are telling us, what are you doing there? Please explain it to me. And if, if again, Great Britain as a big country uh, formally wants to go out, um, is participating in the elections, it's not easy to explain to people. And that is a fundamental question behind. That's why we have still eight weeks, seven weeks of time uh, in Great Britain, when the Prime Minister is asking for early elections, you can uh, 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 do early elections in four weeks' time. That is the, the tradition in Great Britain. So don't tell me that they have not enough time to clarify things in Great Britain until the European elections. It's a matter of will. It's a question mm. of will. And prolongation, extension means only postponement. It means not clarifying things. That is what we saw already. So that's why I think we are on a moment, in a moment where we have to ask the Brits, we are friends. Again, we are friends. We want to have a good future together. So it's also, in a friendship, it's also a kind of a, in such a relationship, to ask the others, please tell me, tell me. Yeah? It's not only a British thing, it's also a thing for us. I think there's a, another, there's a question at the back, the young gentleman there. Johan Barros from uh, Accountants Europe. Um, we at Accountants Europe, we believe that the next five years of the Commission needs to see a green twist in our tax systems. We need a tax system that incentivizes a turn towards greener energies. I guess it links a bit to the carbon tax question as well, but I think it's a wider question as well. Um, uh, would, you, would you foresee a common EU, uh, Commission approach to um, energy taxation and by extension also linking to your views on quali qualified majority voting on taxation and digital companies, would you also see the need to move to qualified majority voting when council decides on energy taxation proposals. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Then here, the lady here in the back. And here we are. Oh, we have here. And Marine, yes. So perhaps we do four. Uh, hello, Chiara Zanini from Your Optimum Um We've touched many policy fields, but not one of the pillars, which is like the agricultural policy. So I would like to have any comments on the reform of the common agricultural policy. Thank you. Then Marine. Marine Khan from the FT. Uh, hello, Marine from the Financial Times. Uh, Mr. Weber, if you become Commission President, will you appoint a British Commissioner for a country that's on its way out? Um, can we take a fourth one uh, in this round? Because I think otherwise we will not be able to hear Ant Antonio. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Antonio Garcia, Banco Santander. Uh, looking for a new Airbus in Europe. Let me give you an idea. What about creating a European cloud? Today, we have in, in, in Europe four clouds, three Americans and one Chinese. If we care about uh, European independence and sovereignty, we need to have and to control our, our data in Europe. That could be an idea for a new uh, European Airbus. So thank you so much for the questions, very precise, concrete questions. Start with the last one. I like the idea. And uh, you, can, you can again uh, uh, complain and attack, oh, Manfred Weber is not anymore believing in, in, in a global dimension of internet because he's looking for an European cloud or something like this. Frankly speaking, I don't believe in this. 
I don't believe in this. I don't want to have a social media. I don't want to have an internet structure which is, which is driven by an American thinking, only Wild Wild West. And I don't want to have a digital development which is driven by the Chinese, Orwell behind. I don't want to have this. I want to have a social media, a digitalization, um, driven by our values, privacy, data protection, copyright. That is what I believe in. And I think it will be, on the long run, more sustainable than the American business model with Facebook and Twitter. Because the companies already feel and see that without fundamental values, a business model is not sustainable. When I arrive here in the Brussels airport, a lot of advertisement from Google, that, uh, I read the advertisement of Google, they tell me that all the devices in the global level are safe, more than 36 million devices are safe, and then they add also yours is safe. And then I'm always getting concerned, why do Google have a com uh, 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 access to my device? So that is what I have in mind. So, you know, that is, that we have some fundamental values and we have to look for European technological solutions on this. I believe fully in this. The second thing is about agriculture. You know, it's a big, big issue. I want to uh, commit myself to the, to the agriculture field. My party, the EPP, let me say, is the farmers party of Europe. We are rooted in the regional areas. So we are close to the farmers. And I think that, again, the um, agriculture field is not a normal uh, a business field, especially when it is about global level. Uh, I think that the money for the European uh, pharma sector is still needed because we have much higher standards in a lot of fields, environmental standards and so on, than the rest of the world has. And we have also in some key elements uh, to defend our, 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 our agriculture uh, 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 market uh, on European level. So the third question was about the taxation in energy field. Um, again, taxation, I answered already, I would be very careful, but in special fields there is a need to do more. Um, if we can use the taxation as a key element to improve the energy policy, that will be a very difficult task on European level, frankly speaking. So we should more focus on research and on the energy market, so to create a common market that is much more effective for us on European level. And the question whether I should accept a commissioner from Great Britain, so I don't know. I don't know what will happen. So <laughs> let's see for the moment, even if I don't like it so much, you heard my statements. Uh, I must say that it's becoming more and more likely that there will be a British uh, commissioner, <laughs> but, uh, but I don't like it. Uh, I don't think that this is an appropriate way to manage the next upcoming weeks and months. And, uh, and let's see, I respect our Lisbon Treaty, so we have to respect the legal base. And if they are still inside of the European Union, they have, to, they have the right to present the Commissioner. So let's see what will be the outcome of the, the days and tomorrow's negotiations. And uh, if this is a final round, do, would you allow me to say I've, a final word? I've got one know? more question for okay. you, because you're facing probably the most fragmented uh, European Parliament um, since the creation of, of the Parliament. So, um, and, and you also have this difficult position of being, you know, representing the, the, the you know, the, the, the main force already dominating EU politics. Um, and so how, how, and, you know, you, you're now facing, you know, new, new creatures like Macron, you know, criticizing the old established grouping, um, telling, you know, everybody that they are no, no longer relevant because because torn with contradictions and that you, you know, for example, you haven't decided to expel Fidesz, you're suspending them only. Um, how do you, how do you view, um, you know, how, how are you, you know, if, if you're becoming the, the, the biggest force, how do you even like overcome all these hurdles to become president of the, com the commission, given all those oppositions, fragmentation, opposition to Spitzenkandidaten um, process? Well, <laughs> let me start with, with my fundamental idea that I believe in a democratic Europe. The European Union of today is seen, from a citizen's point of view, as a bureaucratic, as a technocratic, as a diplomatic institution, an external power who is imposing legislation, which I have to follow then afterwards. And that was the ground for the populists in Great Britain to tell people I want to have my sovereignty back. That's why if we don't arrive if we cannot arrive in a Europe which is close to people, which is a democratically elected European Union, then Europe will fail, full stop. It will fail. It cannot have a future. 
Because people will not accept anymore that an external power decides and I have no say in this. That will not be accepted anymore. And that's why I believe in this. And that's why my party believes in this. I spoke already about Helsinki and so on, about the, even the council members. And then we will arrive after the elections, let's see. The first say is in the hand of the people of Europe, they decide. If we have the privilege to arrive again as the biggest political force in Europe, if we are the biggest uh, faction in the European Parliament, then I think we have a kind of a legitimacy to, to ask for leadership. Uh, we know as European People's Party that we cannot have any more all the three presidents in our, my, uh, our hand, that's, that's clear, that we have to find a balanced approach, everybody knows this, but the strongest group can ask for the most important job, and that will be the Commission President. And again, in my camp, in my team, it is clarified that I'm the candidate, so I don't see a problem in this regard. Uh, and then we will start with this. I don't know how the others will behave. Again, I don't know who is the liberal candidate. We speak a lot about uh, Westhager. I, I respect her very much as a commissioner. He did a good, she did a good job. But is she candidate for which post? Or, or is Rutte candidate for council or whatever? So nobody knows exactly what is the plan of the liberals. And the socialists, it's clear with Franz Timmermans. So they also have a clear decision. And then we will arrive afterwards and then people will give us uh, an idea of what they ask us to do when we see the new comp composition of the European Parliament, about the big the size of the groups. When the Greens arrive as a strong group here, we have to do more on climate change. It's obvious. Eh? The people give us and say. Uh, and, and, and then we have to, to make afterwards kind of a, a talks among the parties. I would hope to achieve, and that is also what I want to do afterwards, to not only speak about the posts, because at the moment in the bubble and in the media there is so much discussion going on about who gets which post. I want to start first of all about a mandate together with the socialists, greens, liberals, with those who are clearly committed for a pro-European development. I want to sit together and talk about where are we in 2024? What do we want to achieve in the next five years? Please sum up, compromise, make a kind of a mandate for the next five years. I wouldn't call it coalition agreement that's too far reaching, but a kind of a mandate for the next five years. What do we have to do now? And if this is in June this year, the dominating issue, then we can tell, tell people that your vote counts. In the light of the outcome of the European elections, we will define the program for the next five years. That is what I want to work for. And again, my party is quite united, or is united, I would say. And then let's see what the others will do. Um, for the moment, we even have no clear indication where <coughs> Emmanuel Macron wants to arrive afterwards, in which, in which team, how, how strong the different groups will be, what is on the right side, on the more extreme side. And let me finally say that the biggest threat for us is for sure having the fragmentation in mind, what you, what you mentioned, having, let me say, the landscape in mind. It can happen, having the polls at the moment in mind, it can happen that we wake up on the 27th of May in a Europe where the European Parliament is similar to the British one in a way that there is only majorities for no's and no majority anymore for yes, for compromise, for togetherness, for future orientation. That can happen when populists and extremists are becoming stronger and stronger. And uh, having this in mind, we have to do our best in the next upcoming weeks to convince people to participate. We see low turnout in a lot of countries, it's a shame from a democratic point of view, and to show alternatives, that people have an idea why they go to vote, why they should vote in favor of socialist, greens, EPP, or others, because we have different programs behind uh, our method. And if you allow the most important question, probably, this year in 2019, what Europeans have to answer, is again the question of identity. When Le Pen is standing in front of people and is making campaign, then she tells people, be proud about your French background and to help with Europe. That is what mainly is their message. And there we have a lot of populists. Yesterday they met in Italy, in Milan. No? We have a lot of these populists to tell people exactly this, to create splits between the identities. And what is my answer? My answer is the old saying of one of the uh, strong leaders of my party. He said once, Bavaria is my home, Germany is my nation, and Europe is my future say this for me as well. I'm German, I'm a Bavarian, that is my, where I feel really at home. 
And I don't allow any populists to make out of these identities a split. Huh? That belongs together, to be Bavarian, German, and European. Like others would say, I'm from uh, Milan, I'm an Italian, and I'm an European. That belongs together. And that is the key question which people have to answer this year, whether we allow, again, to go back to fragmentation, to nationalism, to egoism on this continent, or whether we believe in togetherness and, and combining these identities. And that is what I believe in, and that is what we have to fight for in the upcoming weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Manfred Thank, Thank you, everyone. You.